Hello and welcome to this section of your continuing education program. In this module, we're going to be covering Massachusetts General Laws, and the sections that we're going to be covering are as follows. Chapter 82, Sections 40 through 40E. Chapter 82A. Chapter 164, Section 76D. And then we're going to finish up with a presentation on Commonwealth of Massachusetts Regulation 220, Dig Safe. Some of this material we've already covered in previous presentations, so as we approach that material, we'll get through it as quickly as possible. Now, let's go ahead and get started. And first up is going to be Chapter 82, The Layout, Alteration, Relocation, and Discontinuance of Public Ways and Specific Repairs Thereon. Before we get to that, we have to go through some definitions. However, all of these definitions have been covered in previous presentations, so we're just going to go ahead and flip through them. And first up of Chapter 82 is Section 40A, Excavation, and it's referring specifically to notice. And it says that no excavator installing a new facility or an addition to an existing facility or a relay or repair of an existing facility shall, except in an emergency, make an excavation in any public or private way any company right-of-way or easement or any public or privately owned property or way unless at least 72 hours exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, but not more than 30 days before the proposed excavation is to be made, such excavator has pre-marked not more than 500 feet of the proposed excavation and given an initial notice to the system. The notice requirements shall be waived in an emergency as defined herein. Provided, however, that before such excavation begins or during a life-threatening emergency, notification shall be given to the system and the initial point of boring or excavation shall be pre-marked. The excavator shall ensure that the underground facilities or the utilities in the area of such excavation will not be damaged or jeopardized. In no event shall any excavation by blasting take place unless notice thereof, either in the initial notice or a subsequent notice accurately specifying the date and location of such blasting shall have been given and received at least 72 hours in advance, except in the case of an unanticipated obstruction requiring blasting when such notice shall be given not less than four hours prior to such blasting. If any such notice cannot be given as aforesaid because of an emergency requiring blasting, it shall be given as soon as may be practicable, but before any explosives are discharged. And now, Section 40B of Chapter 82, Designation of Location of Underground Facilities. Within 72 hours, exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, from the time the initial notice is received by the system, or at such time as the company and the excavator agree, such company shall respond to the initial notice or subsequent notice by designating the location of the underground facility within 15 feet in any direction of the pre-marking so that the existing facilities are to be found within a safety zone. Such safety zones shall be designated by the use of standard color-coded markings. The provisions of such designation by the company shall constitute prima facie, 
prima facie, simply meaning as it seems or as it seems at first sight. Evidence of the exercise of reasonable precaution by the company as required by this section. Now if the excavator has given notice to the company, but the company, due to the length of the excavation, cannot reasonably mark all of its underground facilities in such a 72-hour period, then such excavator shall identify for the company that portion of the excavation which is to be made first, and the company shall designate the excavation of its facilities in such a portion within 72 hours and shall designate the location of its facilities in the remaining portion of the location within a reasonable time thereafter. When an emergency notification has been given to the system, the company shall make every attempt to designate the facilities as promptly as possible. Section 40C is the excavator's responsibility to maintain those designated markings and the steps to take if damage is caused by the excavator. After a company has designated the location of its facilities at the location in accordance with Section 40B, the excavator shall be responsible for maintaining the designated markings at such location, unless such excavator requests remarking at that location due to the obliteration, destruction, or other removal of those markings. The company shall then remark such locations within 24 hours following the receipt of this request. When excavating in close proximity to an underground facility of any company, when such facilities are to be exposed, non-mechanical means shall be employed, as necessary, to avoid damage to locating such facility and any further excavation shall be performed employing reasonable precautions to avoid damage to any underground facilities including, but not limited to, any substantial weakening of structural or lateral support of such facilities, penetrations or destructions of any pipe, main, wire, or conduit, or the protective coating thereof, or damage to any pipe, main, wire, or conduit. Now, if any such damage to a pipe, main, wire, or conduit, or its protective coating occurs, the company shall be notified immediately by the excavator who has caused such damage. Now, if such an excavation begins without providing the notice required by Section 40A with respect to any proposed excavation, which results in any damage to a pipe, a wire, or conduit, or its protective coating, shall be prima facie evidence in the legal or administration proceedings that such damage was caused by the negligence of such person. And now, Section 40D, Local Laws Requiring Excavation Permits, specifically Public Ways. Nothing in this chapter shall affect or impair local ordinances or bylaws requiring a permit to be obtained before an excavation on a public way or on private property. But notwithstanding any general or special law, any ordinance or bylaw to the contrary, to the extent that any permit issued under the provisions of the State Building Code or State Fire Code requires excavation by an excavator on a public way or on a private way, the permit shall not be valid unless the excavator notifies the system as required pursuant to Section 40 and 40A before the commencement of the excavation and has complied with the permitting requirements of Chapter 82A. Section 40E Violations of Sections 40A through 40E, specifically the punishment. Any person or company found by the Department of Telecommunications and Energy after a hearing to have violated any provisions of Sections 40A to 40E shall be fined $1,000 for the first offense and not less than $5,000 nor more than $10,000 for any subsequent offense 
within a 12 consecutive month as set forth by the rules of said department, provided, however, that nothing herein shall be construed to require forfeiture of any penal sum by a state or a local government body for violations of Section 40A or 40C, and provided further that nothing herein shall be construed to require the forfeiture of any penal sum by a residential property owner for failure to pre-mark for an excavation on such person's residential property. And now, MGL Chapter 82A, Excavation and Trench Safety. Section 1. Unattended Open Trenches, Safety Hazards, Rules and Regulations, and Fines. An excavator shall not leave an open trench unattended without first making reasonable efforts to eliminate any recognized safety hazard that may exist as a result of leaving the trench unattended. The Commissioner of Public Safety, in conjunction with the Director of Labor and Workforce Development or his designee, shall promulgate rules and regulations governing all construction-related excavations and trench safety. The rules and regulations shall include, but not be limited to, a description of recognized safety hazards that may exist as a result of leaving open trenches and excavations unattended, a description of the procedures required or recommended by the department to eliminate safety hazards which may include coverings, barricading, or otherwise protecting open trenches from accidental entry and a penalty structure for each violation of the proposed rules and regulations to be imposed by the department empowered with ensuring the compliance with the rules and regulations. This penalty structure shall include the imposition of a fine for each violation of the regulations promulgated pursuant to this section. Any such fines collected by the Department of Public Safety or the Department of Labor and Workforce Development shall be available for expenditure without further appropriation by those departments in an amount not to exceed $100,000 during each fiscal year for the sole purpose of providing construction safety training for licensed persons of hoisting equipment, police department officials, fire department officials, and building officials. Those departments may also charge a reasonable fee to help defray the costs associated with the said training. Any monies collected from the imposition of these fines in excess of $100,000 shall be transmitted monthly by those departments to the state treasurer who shall then deposit the excess funds into the general fund. The Department of Public Safety, in conjunction with the Department of Labor and Workforce Development, shall file a report detailing the amount of fines imposed, collected, and expended pursuant to this section with the House and Senate Committees on Ways and Means and with the Joint Committees on Public Safety no later than August 15th of each year. The rules and regulations shall not be effective until the Department of Public Safety has received a formal determination from the United States Secretary of Labor that the proposed rules or regulations do not seek to assume responsibility for the development and enforcement therein of occupational safety and health standards relating to any occupational safety or health issue with respect to which a federal standard has already been promulgated under 29 U.S.C. Section 667 or until the rules and regulations are approved by the United States Secretary of Labor as a state plan for the development of the standards and their enforcement pursuant to 29 U.S.C. Section 667-C. Section 2. Trench excavating permits, permits issued by a board or officer, 
certificates of insurance, and fees. Each city or town or public agency shall designate one board or officer to issue permits for the excavation of trenches on any privately owned land and for the excavation of a public way for any city or town. The permits, when issued, shall include a summary of sections 40 to 40D inclusive of chapters 82 and a summary of the regulations promulgated by the Department of Public Safety relative to Chapter 146. No person, except in an emergency, shall contract for the making of a trench in any public property or privately owned property until a permit has been obtained from the appropriate designated person within the city or town or public agency that is authorized to issue the permit. The person shall notify the local permitting authority of the exact location of the trench. A person making an application for a trench excavation permit shall produce a certificate of insurance with a general liability coverage of $100,000 per person and $300,000 per claim or provide evidence of self-insurance in equal amounts. The local permitting authority may charge a reasonable fee to cover the administrative costs of the trench excavation permitting process incurred by the municipality in connection with the review and the processing of the permits, but gas companies as defined in Section 1 of Chapter 164 or any corporation that is subject to the provisions of Chapter 165, 166, or 166A, which has already paid a fee in order to attain a permit to excavate a public way of a city or town, shall not be responsible for paying an additional fee for the same excavation. Section 3. Form of Trench Excavation Permits. Required Statements. A permit to excavate a trench issued pursuant to this chapter may be in any form authorized by the local permitting authority, but shall include the following statements. A trench shall not be excavated unless the requirements of Section 40 to 40D inclusive of Chapter 82 and any accompanying requirements have been met and this permit is invalid unless the requirements have been complied with by the excavator applying for the permit, including, but not limited to, the establishment of a valid excavation number with the underground plant damage prevention system as provided in Section 76D of Chapter 164. Trenches may pose a significant health and safety hazard. Pursuant to Section 1 of Chapter 82, an excavator shall not leave an open trench unattended without first making reasonable efforts to eliminate any recognized safety hazards that may exist as a result of leaving the open trench unattended. Excavators should consult regulations promulgated by the Department of Public Safety in order to familiarize themselves with the recognized safety hazards associated with excavations and open trenches and the procedures required or recommended by the Department to eliminate safety hazards which may include covering, barricading, or otherwise protecting open trenches from accidental entry. Next, persons engaging in any kind of a trenching operation shall familiarize themselves with the federal safety standards promulgated by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration on excavations. 29 CFR 1926.650 Subpart P Excavations Excavators engaging in any trenching operations who utilize hoisting or other mechanical equipment subject to Chapter 146 shall only employ individuals licensed to operate said equipment by the Department of Public Safety pursuant to said Chapter 146, and this permit shall be presented to licensed operators before any excavation is commenced. By applying for, accepting, and signing this permit, 
the applicant hereby attests to the following, that he has read and understands the regulations promulgated by the Department of Public Safety with regard to construction-related excavations and trench safety, that he has read and understands the federal standards promulgated by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration on excavations, 29 CFR 1926.650, subpart P, excavations, and that he is aware of and has, with regard to the proposed excavation on private property, or the proposed excavation of a city or town or public way that forms the basis of his permit application, complied with the requirements of Sections 40 to 40D inclusive of Chapter 82 and with the requirements set forth in this chapter. And finally, this permit shall be posted in plain view on the site. Section 4 of Chapter 82A is Definitions, and there are no definitions here that have not been previously covered in other presentations and earlier in this presentation. Section 5 is Additional Requirements. The requirements of this chapter are in addition to the requirements set forth in Sections 40 to 40D inclusive of Chapter 82 and not in lieu thereof. All natural gas pipeline companies, cable television companies, steam distribution companies, and public utility companies, as defined in Section 3 of Chapter 25, shall create, participate in, and be responsible for the administration of a utility underground plant damage prevention system. This system shall be operated during normal business hours each day of the year, exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays, for the purposes of receiving notices of proposed excavations in public ways, utility right-of-ways, and in privately owned land under which public utility companies, municipality utility departments, cable television companies, steam distribution companies, or natural gas pipeline companies, maintains underground facilities including pipes, mains, wires, or conduits as required by the provisions of Section 40 of Chapter 82. This system shall also be responsible for, upon receipt of such notices, for immediately notifying such natural gas pipeline companies, public utility companies, cable television companies, steam distribution companies, and municipal utility departments that supply gas, electricity, cable television service, or telephone service in or to such cities or towns where such excavation is to take place of such proposed excavations. The cost of operating the utility underground plant damage prevention system shall be apportioned equitably among the natural gas pipeline companies, the public utility companies, the cable television companies, the steam distribution companies, and the municipality utility departments that supply gas, electricity, cable television service, or telephone service within the Commonwealth, according to a formula to be fixed by agreement of the companies. The Department is authorized to investigate the operation of said system and to adopt procedures necessary and appropriate to hear and resolve complaints for failure to comply with the provisions of Section 40 of Chapter 82. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you can hang in there just a little bit longer, our final segment, Dig Safe. As always, let's begin with purpose and scope. 220 CMR 99 defines terms and delineates the duties of those subject to MGL Chapter 82 Section 40, also known as the Dig Safe Law. It also establishes procedures for determining the nature and extent of violations of MGL 82 Section 40 and procedures for issuance of notice of probable violations a remedial order or a consent order with respect to such violations. 
In addition, 220 CMR 99 sets forth the standards used to determine the amount of civil penalties to be imposed. Every gas, electric, or telephone company, a municipal gas or electric department, a natural gas pipeline company, a petroleum or petroleum products pipeline company, a private water company, and cable television company, shall report all suspected violations of MGL Chapter 82, Section 42 to the Department of Telecommunications and Energy. This notice should be given within 30 days of learning of the circumstances constituting the suspected violation. Any other person may report a suspected violation of MGL Chapter 82, Section 42 to the Department. All such reports shall be in a form deemed appropriate and necessary by the Department. 9902 is, once again, definitions, and these are all definitions that we've already previously covered, so we are going to once again just quickly flip through them. Ninety nine point zero three is pre markings, and section one states that pre markings shall occur before an excavator or as given notice of an excavation to the system. When pre marking in an area where white marks may interfere with traffic or pedestrian control, or when white marks might otherwise be difficult to see, the excavator should consider using an alternative color other than a standard color code as laid out in CMR 220 99.02 and must inform the Dig Safe Center in the notice that an alternative color has been used. And number three, which has been previously covered when excavating to replace a guardrail or fence, an excavator may use the pre-existing guardrail or fence as the pre-mark. If the new guardrail is not colonar with the pre-existing guardrail or fence, the excavator must pre-mark only that area to be excavated that will differ from the pre-existing guardrail or fence. Next up is 99.04 Excavation Notice, and some of this has been covered for specific types of excavations earlier in this program. However, let's go through it again just for good measure. And first up is notice of an excavation shall be tendered to the system at least 72 hours exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, but not more than 30 days prior to the commencement of the excavation. Such notice shall include a description of the excavation location and the date that the excavation is expected to begin. Number two, in an emergency, the excavator may commence an excavation after having taken all reasonable steps consistent with the commencement to notify the system and to pre-mark the excavation site. Number three, each company shall establish standard operating procedures to identify the location of its respective underground facilities as soon as practicable after receiving notification of an emergency excavation, whether or not the excavation has begun. Circumstances requiring an emergency excavation shall not excuse the excavator from the requirement to use all reasonable means to avoid damaging an underground facility. Emergency dig safe markings are invalid after the cessation of the emergency. Further excavation at the location shall require notice as set forth in 220 CMR 99.04 Part 1. And item number 6, which refers to blasting, was just covered verbatim earlier in this presentation when we were discussing MGL Chapter 82. Next up is 99.05 Marking Procedures. 
Once again, some of this material was covered in previous presentations. However, it is required material to be covered here in DigSafe, so let's go ahead and quickly review. Every company shall use the centerline method to identify the location of its respective underground facilities. The underground facilities shall be completely located within a safety zone no more than 18 inches plus the width of the facility from the designated center line. All markings shall indicate where practicable if it is greater than 2 inches and material of the underground facility as well as any change in direction and any terminus points of the facility. Markings shall extend at least 15 feet beyond the boundaries of the pre-marked area. Within 72 hours exclusive of Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays from the time that the initial notice is received by the system or at such time as the company and the excavator agree, every company shall mark the location of an underground facility by applying a visible fluid such as paint on the ground above the facility. The company may use an alternative marking method of color-coded stakes, color-coded flags, or color-coded brush-type markers. In a paved area designated as a historical location, a company may use chalk, stakes, flags, or brush-type markers, or other suitable devices with the appropriate color-coded fixed or attached colors instead of the marking fluid itself. The color codes listed under 220 CMR 99.02 shall be used for the placement of marks, whether by visible fluid or alternative marking methods. If the surface above the underground facility is to be removed, the company may place supplemental offset marks. These marks must be uniformly aligned and must indicate the specific distance from the markings to the underground facility. After a company has marked the location of its facilities, the excavator shall be responsible for maintaining the markings at such location, unless such excavator, after pre-marking, requests remarking at the location due to the obliteration, destruction, or other removal of such markings. The company shall then remark such locations within 24 hours following the receipt of this request. Markings shall be valid for an excavation site until one of the following occurs. First, the excavation does not commence within 30 days of the notification. Second, the markings become faded, illegible, or destroyed. Third, a company installs a new underground facility in a marked area still under excavation. And finally, an emergency condition is brought to a conclusion which nullifies any markings installed during the emergency. And now 99.06 excavations. There are only two items here that were not previously covered in other presentations, so let's quickly go over those. When excavating in close proximity to an underground facility of any company, non-mechanical means shall be employed as necessary to avoid damage to locating such facility and any further excavation shall be performed employing reasonable precautions to avoid damage to any underground facilities including but not limited to any substantial weakening of structural or lateral support of such facilities penetrations or destructions of any pipe main wire or conduit or the protective coating thereof, or damage to any pipe, main, wire, or conduit. In such cases, mechanical means may only be used for the initial penetration of the pavement, rock, or other such materials, so long as no mechanical means are employed after the paving, rock, or other material has been penetrated. If an excavator damages a company's underground facility or has reason to believe that a company's underground facility may be damaged or compromised in any way as a result of the excavator's actions, the excavator must notify the company as soon as possible. Next is 99.07, Notice of Probable Violations, 
commencement of enforcement proceedings. And first up, the department may begin a proceeding by issuing a Notice of Probable Violation, or NOPV, if the department has reason to believe that a violation of MGL Chapter 82, Section 40 has occurred or is occurring. The NOPV shall be issued by the Commission or its designee. The NOPV shall state the factual basis for the allegation of a violation and the amount of the civil penalty which may be assessed against the person being served, if the Department finds that the violation has occurred. The NOPV shall state that the respondent has a right to reply in writing to the NOPV or appear at an informal conference with the Department on a designated day which is at least 21 days from the date of the NOPV. Any written reply must be filed with the Department on or before the day of the respondent's designee. It must include a complete statement of all relevant facts and authority and full description of the reasons that the respondent is disputing the violation as alleged in the NOPV. If the respondent or the respondent's representative fails without good cause to either file a written reply or to appear at an informal conference, the respondent shall be deemed to have admitted the accuracy of the factual allegations and legal conclusions stated in the NOPV and the respondent shall be held liable to pay all the civil penalties designated in the NOPV through the issuance of a remedial order pursuant to 220 CMR 99.10. Now 99.08 Informal Reviews. An informal review shall be conducted by an investigator designated by the Commission. The informal review shall consist of an informal conference. If the respondent has chosen this option under 220 CMR 99.07 or an analysis of the respondent's written reply, the investigators shall make a decision in writing which will be sent to the respondent by mail return receipt requested. If the respondent is not satisfied with the decision, the respondent may request an adjudicatory hearing provided that such request is made in writing within 10 days of the date of receipt of the decision. Failure to request the adjudicatory hearing will be deemed an admission of the factual allegations and legal conclusions stated in the investigator's decision, and the respondent shall be held liable to pay the civil penalties designated in the investigator's decision through the issuance of a remedial order under 220 CMR 99.10. Now 99.09, the actual adjudicatory hearing proceedings. The adjudicatory hearing shall be a de novo hearing, de novo simply meaning from the beginning, and shall be an adjudicatory proceeding as defined in MGL Chapter 30A and conducted pursuant to 220 CMR 1.00, the Department's procedural regulations. At the adjudicatory hearing, the respondent shall have the right to be represented by an attorney or other person. If the Department finds after the hearing that the respondent has violated MGL Chapter 82, Section 40, it may issue a remedial order pursuant to 220 CMR 99.10. If the division determines or the department finds after the request for an adjudicatory decision has been filed that the evidence supports a determination that the respondent violated MGL Chapter 82 Section 40 in a respect not stated in the original NOPV or decision of the investigator, the division shall issue an NOPV with respect to the violation so determined or found. Now the aforementioned 99.10 remedial orders. If the department finds that a violation has occurred or is occurring and continues to occur, it may issue a remedial order. The remedial order shall include a written opinion 
setting forth the factual and legal basis of the Department's findings, and shall direct any party to take any action which is consistent with the party's obligations under MGL Chapter 82, Section 40, including the payment of a civil penalty as provided by said statute. A remedial order issued by the Department under 220 CMR 99.10 shall be in effect upon issuance in accordance with its terms unless stayed, suspended, modified, or rescinded. A remedial order is a final decision of the Department within the meaning of MGL Chapter 25, Section 5, and thereby subject to review by the Supreme Judicial Court. If the respondent fails to either appeal the remedial order to the Supreme Judicial Court or to comply fully with the order within 20 days, the Department may refer the case to the Attorney General with a request that an action be brought in the Superior Court to seek appropriate relief, including but not limited to the collection of the assessed penalties. 99.11 is consent orders. Notwithstanding any other provisions to the contrary, the Department may at any time resolve an outstanding enforcement issue with a consent order. A consent order must be signed by the person to whom it is issued or a duly authorized representative and must indicate agreement with the terms therein. A consent order need not constitute an admission by any person that a violation has occurred. A consent order is a final order of the Department, having the same force and effect as a remedial order issued pursuant to 220 CMR 99.10. A consent order shall not be appealable by the respondent and shall include an expressed waiver of appeal or judicial review rights that might otherwise attach to the final order of the department. And now folks, 99.12 Civil Penalties, our final segment of this continuing education program. Any person who, any person who, all right, knock it off. Any person, contractor, excavator, or company found by the department to have violated any provisions of the Dig Safe Law or regulations adopted by the Department shall be subject to a civil penalty not to exceed $500 for the first offense and not less than $1,000, nor more than $5,000 for any subsequent offense. On a subsequent offense, if a respondent demonstrates a period of 12 consecutive months without which the department has not found the respondent in violation of the dig safe law the department shall cite the respondent the first offense civil penalty of five hundred dollars in determining the amount of a civil penalty the department shall consider the nature circumstances and gravity of the violation the degree of the respondents culpability the respondent's history of prior offenses and the respondent's level of cooperation with the requirements of 220 CMR 99.00. And ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude your continuing education program for your hoisting license.